Hello, Wellspring family, and welcome to church service this morning. So glad to have you joining us live this morning. Just wanted to give a special note before we get started. We do have some severe weather coming in, so if by chance we do get cut off, uh, we'll fix it as quickly as possible. Don't worry. Uh, we're on it. We're watching it, and we're going to stay tuned. So if you do hear some thunder, it's the Lord clapping alongside of Michael's message. He loves Michael. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, you might hear some thunder in the background. We've, we've noticed it. Uh, we love you guys. We're excited to get started. Let me pray for us as we lead into worship. God, thank you for being with us this morning in our homes, with joining us with our families. Uh, God, I just ask that you would be a part of every single living room, uh, be in every single bedroom that this is watched, that you would join us this morning as we worship you. God, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my
Breathing in 
Thank you, Jesus, for being with us this morning. God, we so value your presence. We're so thankful this week, especially in light of Easter, that your son came to live and to die for us and to raise, be risen from the grave so that we can walk in relationship with you. So this morning, God, we ask that in the midst of the darkness all around the world that you would call us to be light. God, that you'd call us to shine our lights in our families, in our friends, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. God, even if it is online, give us the ideas, the creativity uh, to really share your gospel, even now to the ends of the earth. God, let us stand up um, and share your name. We love you, Lord. It's your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we have a great service in store for you. Uh, Michael's going to be starting a new series this morning. Looking forward to that. Really quickly, we encourage you, take a selfie. Send it to some friends and family real quick. Shoot them a text. Uh, let them know you're watching service online this morning, that you miss them, that you wish you could be with them. Uh, but we're going to get through this together, guys. I think we're hopefully seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We're so looking forward to seeing you in person again. Uh, being a part of our family together. Uh, Quickly, if you haven't joined our Friends of God online community, we encourage you to do that. It's through Facebook. You can see some of the instructions on the screen there. Just very simply search that uh, on Facebook. It should pop up as the first or maybe one of the first options. This is a great place to stay connected. Uh, This is where we're posting all of our content, all of the things that we're doing throughout the week to make sure that you're staying connected uh, to one another and plugged into the Word, uh, growing in your relationship with the Lord. This week specifically, one of the things that I really enjoyed, we had a broadcast from Remnant Radio that was shared uh, on that page. It was with several of the local church pastors, and they talked about what it's like to do church online. If you haven't seen it, encourage you to watch that, but there's so much more. Uh, please tune into that. Check out, check in on some of the things that we're posting there. It's a great way to stay connected. Also, uh, we are so blessed by your generosity during this season. Uh, there's been so many churches who have struggled and so many different communities who've really had a hard time during this season, but we're blessed because you guys have been so generous. One of the ways we've been able to share this generosity is through a mission that we have locally. It's called I Can Still Shine. Here in a moment, I'm going to share a video with you, but quickly before I do, just know that this is only one of the areas we've been able to be generous as a church. So this morning, as we take our tithes and offerings, just want to let you know that we've dedicated our coronavirus fund to I Can Still Shine. So take a look at this short video, show you what you've been doing in our community. We're here at I Can Shine, and this is our food bank. We do food, clothing, furniture, counseling, cars, car repairs. But since COVID, all we've done is food. We used to feed 30 families or so a month, maybe 35. And we've fed 97 families in the last three weeks. In three weeks, this will all be gone. And so that's the constant need is replenishing it. We don't know how long this is going to go on. June 1st of this year will be our 25th anniversary. We just wanted to help women and children. And from that day till today, God has helped 10,200 women and kids. I know Brenda because I was in domestic violence. Thanks to this program, I've been uh, being helped once a month with food and computer classes. And now um, I have a better job. I work for IKEA. I'm a four-day driver. She helped me with that too. So now I volunteer when I don't have nothing to do in the weekends or during the week. I come over here and help, so all the women can benefit from her too. We're so thankful for your generosity. It's really making a big difference in so many lives around the community, so many people that are really needing help during this season. So here in a minute, when we take our tithes and offerings, if you would like to give over and above your tithe, if you want to classify this offering, just put in there coronavirus fund. 
the coronavirus fund is going to be going to I Can Still Shine to help more women and families, those in need during this season. And if you have any food that you'd like to donate, please bring it to the church. We'll take it over to I Can Still Shine. It's going to make a difference. So we're going to take a moment and do our tithes and offerings. Um, so thankful once again for how generous you've been as a community. Uh, we really encourage you to keep doing that. It's making a difference. Uh, you can give in several different ways. Uh, you can text to give. Uh, you can give on our website, or you can mail us in a check. You'll see that information on the screen here in a minute. Right after offerings, Michael's going to come up and start a new series, Pack Your Bags. It's going to be great. So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to collect our tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you that you are with us in this season. God, that you don't just care about the spiritual things, but you also care about the practical things. God, you care about our resources. You care about our time and our energy and our money, and you want to use all of those things to make us more like Jesus and to use it so that we can extend your gospel to the ends of the earth to spread your kingdom. So this morning, as we take our tithes and offerings, we ask that you would do that. Take what we give, take what we're generous with, and spread the gospel in our community and to the ends of the earth. Lord, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Okay, guys. Well, welcome. So glad that you guys are with us. My name's uh, Michael Roundtree, and, uh, and I'm going to be teaching the scriptures today and starting a brand new series. We'll tell you more about that in a moment. Before we do, I'd just like to pray for our time together uh, and also for our nation. So if you don't mind, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you that through him we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Thank you that we have eternal life because of your sacrifice on the cross and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for all of these things. Lord, uh, your word says in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for kings and those who are in authority. And so, Lord, we pray for President Trump. To whatever degree he needed wisdom before right now, he needs it more than ever right now. And so I pray that you would give it. I pray that you would surround him with the right people, uh, voices uh, speaking about diplomatic relations, voices speaking about uh, economic uh, activity, voices speaking about uh, the coronavirus, and that he'll be able to synthesize all of this information and come to wise decisions. Pray the same for the governors that have been entrusted with authority about reopening this nation. And Lord, we pray for especially the poor in this time. We pray for those who've lost jobs. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them in a special way and that you would empower your church throughout this nation to serve open-handedly, to be thinking less about our survival and more about the thriving of the community and the world around us. Lord, help us to shine our light in a dark time. Father, um, I pray for this morning uh, that as I speak, that my words would be your words and that you would open up our hearts to receive them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Alicia and I have been planning some weekend travel. We're trying to get a little, you know, weekend getaway all cooped up in the house. And, uh, and so we, uh, we've been looking at a travel map, and I just wanted to show you guys the map that we've been looking at to help us come to a decision about where we're headed. <laughs> that pastor's hilarious. Who said that? Okay, so um, I wish I could see you all LOLing right now. I obviously completely stole this from an online meme, but it's meant to be, uh, if you have to tell someone it's a joke, it's, it's a bad joke, I guess, right? Um, well, <laughs> um, I know you guys are laughing hysterically with me, not at me. Um, clearly, clearly, things have changed considerably in the, last, uh, in the last few weeks, and the idea of making plans is completely different 
from what it once was. Nobody's making weekend travel plans these days, and nobody's making uh, plans, even the plans that you had before coronavirus ever happened. Looking into the summer ahead, people are questioning, do I need to cancel that trip? What's happening? It's almost like you can't plan out a single day or week, and certainly not a year like we've kind of become accustomed to. Well, all of this speaks into the series that we're beginning today. It's called uh, it's called Pack Your Bags. Pack Your Bags is the name of it. It's a series about how to deal with change and transition in our lives. And I'll just be honest with you, it's, it's almost like getting a little bit uh, spooky because we've planned these sermon series like in 2019 and prayed as an entire team, what is God saying to our church in the coming year? And, and it's like, it's so appropriate each time. Uh, that we come to it. But just so you guys have a little bit of uh, a sort of uh, uh, understanding of what's coming, we have an exciting next several weeks. Uh, This week, we'll be talking about encountering change. It's just sort of an introduction to change and how we respond to it. Next week, you're not going to want to miss. This is where we move from encountering change to embracing change. And uh, and Caleb Sutherland is going to be with us, a guest speaker. He speaks here uh, often. Uh, but he's going to be in a very famous passage. It's called Jeremiah chapter, uh, or it's Jeremiah chapter twenty-nine, a season in Israel's history where they uh, where they suffered uh, an extreme amount of change and struggled to embrace it. So it's going to be a powerful time. I hope you'll join us. In the weeks after that, we'll talk about navigating change, Mother's Day, how to become a change agent. Those mothers, they can be change agents. We'll talk about that, and then, uh, and then change in personal relationships. So these are some of the things that we have uh, coming down the pike. Today, we're going to zero in specifically on, uh, on change in two areas of our lives, change as it relates to our time and change as it relates to our money, because change affects both of these things. In fact, if change hasn't really affected the way we use our time, and if it hasn't really affected our bank account in any meaningful way, it kind of feels like it's not really change. It feels like any change is manageable as long as these two things, our time and our money, are intact. But if these things start to be touched or even just threatened, to whatever degree they're touched or threatened, our time and our money, we start to get a little uncomfortable. And if these things suffer considerably, if the change is drastic to our time and money, we can start to feel like we ourselves are out of control. How are you feeling about the change that's going on in the world today? On the scale of in control to out of control, where do you feel this morning? When we talk about feeling out of control, and I can understand if you feel that way, because trust me, I've felt that way the last few weeks, and it's, it's been a struggle for me to find my rhythm with God, I'm just being honest. But when we talk about feeling out of control, I have this image in my mind and the image is of, uh, it's of a drowning person who's just kind of, you can just picture, you know, the splashes and the flailing of the arms and the water. And I picture this like lifeguard that's like ready to save this person. But the more this person strives and struggles to be in control, the harder he or she is to rescue. And so I want us to have that image in, my, in our mind as we talk about the change in time and it changes to our time and our money because the way I want us to think about today is just with uh, with this question I want us to think about in uh, in what ways in, in regard to our time and our money can we position ourselves for rescue how can we position ourselves to receive God's loving care if we're the one in the in the water and we feel like we're sinking how can we make it easy to be rescued okay So we're going to answer that question uh, before the day is through. And so we're going to be in James chapter 4, actually chapters 4 and 5. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. If you don't, the words will be up on the screen in just a moment. So uh, the book of James, just a little bit of an introduction to it. James was the half-brother of Jesus. Okay, half-brother because Jesus was born of a virgin. So uh, they grew up together. And, uh, and James wrote, of course, the book of James, and he wrote it to a group of persecuted Jewish Christians. And so a lot of, a lot of people think this, that this is uh, in response to a persecution that bro- broke out, we're told about in Acts chapter 8. And so they spread out to the four winds. They're just going out in all directions. And so he writes a letter to people who've suffered tremendously, and that's a huge theme of the book of James, these people know a thing or two about change. They've been uprooted 
from their homes. And they're not responding very well to the change either. They're, they're struggling to get control of whatever they can get control of. In this case, they're struggling for control of their time, and they're struggling for control of their money. And James considers these things to be a false sense of security. And this explains the sternness of the section of Scripture that we're about to read. So let's read James chapter 4. We'll start with verses 13 to 17. This section talks about how change affects our time. And then the next section, how it affects our money. And in both, how we're to respond. So uh, James chapter 4. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Okay, so James is talking to us about planning, that is managing how we're going to use our time. And if I was to whittle down this short section of verses into a simple statement, it would be this. Are you ready? You are not in control, and you are going to die. It feels too harsh. I know. It feels weird to say. I know. I thought about softening it. I thought about making it a little bit more palatable for us, like, oh, you know, but the reality is that's actually what James is saying. So I just said, you know what? Let's let God speak for himself. Is this not what he says? The point he's making is he's he's saying, listen, guys, you've arrogantly planned out a year into the future down to the finest detail, and you don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen. Life is un predictable, except in this one regard. It's predictably short. He says you are a vapor. You're a mist here today and gone tomorrow. And we can't even talk about efficiently planning our time and our calendar. You know, the the three blog tips for how to manage your time efficiently. We can't even begin to go there until we deal with the issue of the heart. It's like James is saying to these people who are grasping for control and trying to, co- to, to find peace and more efficiently managing their calendar. It's like James is saying, guys, and I believe this is what God is saying to us too, peace won't come by more efficient planning. It comes by surrendering our plans to him. Peace won't come by more efficient planning. It comes by surrendering our plans to him. Now, when I think about like where America's at now and where America was at like one month ago, like this was hugely appropriate for us a month ago, <laughs> right? Like right now, it's like, you I know, mean, a lot of people have all the time in the world. But just think like the last 10 years, okay? The last 20 years, what's like the biggest mantra that you hear these days? I'm so busy. I don't have enough time and everyone's teaching us how to more efficiently slice a minute. And we're promised that if we download this app and we plan our calendar like this and we clear out our email inbox and we follow all these different techniques, we'll finally master our calendar instead of our calendar mastering us. But does it ever happen? It never does. We run faster and faster, and we feel further and further behind. The reason there's never enough time is because there's never enough success to validate us. It's actually the point he's making in verse 16 when he calls them out for arrogance and boasting. What he's saying, to put this in kind of everyday terms, he's saying you guys are filling your calendar in an effort to fill your heart, and it's never going to work because you are a mortal. You're a mortal. You're not immortal. You are not in control. You act like it. You live like it. You act like you're never going to die. You act like you're the master of your domain. And he says you're not. You're not in control. 
and you're going to die. And I just wonder if what the world is going through is actually meant to remind us of these very realities. Last year's, I think maybe exactly a year ago, I had a friend that I visited in the hospital. And it was a huge shock that he was in the hospital at all because he was perfectly healthy. One moment, he's catching a plane to Florida to do a consulting business. The next moment, he's not in Florida, didn't make it there. Next moment, he's in a Dallas emergency room wondering if he's going to make it through. Doctors wondering, family wondering if he's going to make it through. Severely weakened, labored breathing. It goes on for days. It goes on for weeks. And doctors have no explanation. In fact, throughout the whole ordeal and even afterward, there was no explanation from the medical community despite the myriads of tests that they did upon, uh, upon his blood, upon his body, and they couldn't figure it out. They had no explanation, but my friend did have an explanation. It wasn't a scientific one. It was a spiritual. He, I went into his hospital room, and he looked me in the eyes with labored breath, and he said, God is getting my attention. It's like God completely like, wiped out his to-do list. The way he communicated to me and later in an email to a whole bunch of friends uh, he, is, he, is he said that it, it's like my to-do list was so out of control, I felt mastered by my to-do list instead of serving God as my master. And he said this, this whole experience was a wake-up call for me. It took months for him to recover, and he ultimately did. But the point is that drastic change in his schedule and his life brought about a change for him. Sometimes God uses change to change us. And I believe that same wake-up call that occurred for my friend who was humbled by this reality that, you know what, I am going to die. I am not in control. This humbled him so that he could manage his life and his time in a way that was different going forward. And I believe that what has happened to my friend on a micro level in his life is, in, is actually happening in our world on a macro level. I believe God is intending for this change to change us. The silence of our city streets is meant to get us opening our ears and saying, God, what are you communicating to me right now? Sometimes God allows these interruptions to come into our lives because without interruption, we start actually believing this lie, even if we don't literally logically believe it. We just start living as though we are in control and we will live forever. And that reminder of our mortality is important. Moses prays in Psalm 90, the ultimate time management prayer. He says, says, teach us, O Lord, to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. If we think we're in control and if we think we determine whether we'll keep breathing 15 minutes from now, we're not going to order our priorities in the right way. And so when I, when I think about this, and I've, and I've been paying attention to the media, news, and social media, and all of this, and what's, what is everybody saying? Everybody's talking about, when are we going to get back to normal? When are we going get back to normal? But what if that's actually the problem? <laughs> what if our old normal was the problem? Everybody's so busy, everybody's so full, and God's getting crowded out. And I wonder if God is using this as a wake-up call to say, hey, you know what, now that your plate is completely emptied, instead of rushing back to the old number, uh, normal, what if you prayerfully and carefully decided what goes back on the plate? Okay, uh, if we white-knuckle our way back to normalcy, I believe we'll have missed what God has for us. If we're trying to, if we, if we at the end of this use our time in all the same ways that we used it before this ever happened, I believe we've missed the message God has for us. Sometimes God has to stop our world from spinning to get us to stop and listen. I believe at the very least God is using a terrible scenario to speak to his people, to give us the necessary humility to surrender our time and our plans to him. And that's where the peace comes from. So now I want to shift gears. 
and I want to continue reading into chapter 5. Uh, and chapter, at the end of chapter 4, he's primarily talking about how we manage our time. In chapter 5, he'll primarily talk about how we manage our money. Now, the entire book of James is just, it, it's hard to stomach. I mean, he just, he's a blunt guy. Okay, well, to whatever degree he's blunt, we get the blunt of the bluntness right here in chapter 5. But there's actually, uh, th- there's a reason for this. Okay, if, uh, if your child's playing on the train tracks and there's a train coming, you might not mince words. You might yell and scream and shout and try to get this child's attention to get them off the railroad tracks. James views the situation as being that dire, thus the intensity of the language. Let's read chapter 5. Ver- we'll read uh, verses 1 through 5. Here's what he says. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries of that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you when you eat uh, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. And so he begins to get into, he's not talking to all rich people, okay? There are rich godly people, but he's speaking specifically to those who abuse money and he'll go into detail how they've done so. One, they've laid up treasures in the last days. He continues, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your heart in the day of slaughter. Okay. I'm telling you, it's harsh. This is why I decided not to soften James' language to make it more palatable for us. I think that God is shouting into this painful moment of history. He's speaking into how we manage our time. We just saw that. But also here, how we manage our money. And so just like I did with the last one, I want to whittle this down to a single statement of what I believe James is is saying here, and it's this. You will one day give an accounting for your accounting. You will one day give an accounting for your accounting. Okay, this is just a fancy way of saying there's a judgment day coming for how we've used our money. And the language that's so abrupt here is language of judgment. He talks, for instance, about storing up wealth in the last days, okay? In the scripture, that phrase, last days, speaks of the entire duration from when Jesus first came, when Jesus first came to this earth, he came in mercy, and then he's returning to this earth in judgment. The season in between, called the last days, this is the season that we have to respond to his call for mercy. This is James trying to get the child off of the tracks. This is James, when he says, weep and howl, what he's saying is, let your heart be broken and torn with repentance over the fact that you've been hoarding your money instead of generously giving your money and investing in God's purposes, and you've been defrauding your laborers, and you've been living high on the hog, etc., etc. He's using the language of judgment. That's why this is so harsh. And so James is saying, hey, I'm trying to hold you accountable now so that you can come to God in a season of mercy because I don't want you to have to stand before him and give an accounting for your accounting where it's, where it's at right now because that, where it's at right now, we're not in a good place. Now, how should this affect us to know that one day we'll give an accounting for our accounting? Okay, it'll affect us in different ways, okay? Uh, and, and it kind of depends, too, on our situation because there are some people who are completely so far disaffected financially by the crisis that's, uh, that's come upon our nation and our world. There are others who have been dr- drastically affected. It'll affect us in different ways, okay? Uh, one way it'll affect us is that it should fill us with holy fear to know that we'll have to give an accounting for our accounting. And I think this is specifically for those, if you're listening right now and your financial situation is exactly the same, okay, we should take it very seriously that, hey, God has graciously provided for us, but we have brothers and sisters in Christ who they're, they've lost jobs. 22 million Americans lost jobs in the last month. 
The full number of jobs that were lost from the Great Recession of 08 until now have been completely wiped out. Some people you love, know, and care about have lost jobs, are in very hard financial situations. It is incumbent upon those of us who still have our income to recognize that one day we'll give an accounting for our accounting. And if we didn't share with those in need, well, we'll have to answer for that. Okay? So, one, it should fill us with holy fear. The other, and this is especially, this is for all of us, of course, but it's especially for those who are suffering financial loss or the threatened loss of income. Uh, To these, I would say, not only should it fill us with holy fear, but it should also fill us with holy peace, with holy peace. Now, I'll have to unpack that a little bit. In order to unpack that, we have to understand why is James talking about judgment here anyways with regard to how we use our money? Well, this goes back to a very broad biblical, pro, uh, uh, biblical principle called stewardship, and that is the idea that the money in your bank account right now is actually not your money. It's God's money. The watch on your wrist right now, the shoes on your feet, the car in your garage, the home that you're living in, everything that you own, you don't actually own. You just manage it. It's as the scripture says, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. The gold and silver, Haggai chapter 2, are mine. And what this means is we don't own anything. We are just money managers. Now, if you had somebody managing your money, would you just say, hey, use my money however you please. I don't, ever, I don't even care. I'm never going to check in. Or would you say, hey, it, I, it actually matters to me how you use my money. Well, just like you would hold your, manage, your money manager accountable, God holds us, his money managers, accountable. And you say, well, that still fills me with holy fear, but not so much holy peace. Okay, we're getting to that. Let's get there now. Have you ever noticed how it's much more stressful to own a house than to rent or maybe even to house sit? It's much more stressful to own a boat or an RV than to buy one. RV and boat owners, you're like amening that right now. Or to use another example, it's much more stressful, uh, it's much more stressful to have a child and raise it than to babysit. You're beginning to understand stewardship. Once you understand that you don't actually own anything that you own, you're just managing it, it actually becomes burden relief. It's actually a de-stressor. Why? Because if you lose your job, if you lose your income, or if you you lose a portion of your income, it's actually not your loss. It's God's loss, and he has the power to make it up. He doesn't have, he doesn't hold you accountable for manufacturing jobs and money out of the clear blue air. He just holds you accountable for managing that portion that you have been given, whether it is much or it is little. And once you operate in that zone, it actually does fill you with holy peace. Peace doesn't come by having more money. Just ask the billionaires that are fleeing to bunkers right now. Peace doesn't come by having more money. Peace comes by surrendering our money to God. Saying, okay, God, it's yours. How do you want me to use it? Now, in regard to the financial crisis that's shaking our world today, I'm not going to say that I have any special insights. Sometimes I hear preachers and and YouTube voices, <laughs> you know, saying, well, this is because of this and that's because of that. I can't tell you whether this is the judgment of God or whether this is an attack from Satan or whether this is just the outcome of living in a fallen and broken world, okay? I could actually use the Bible and point to all three of those things, so I'm not going to pretend that I have a special insight or explanation, but here's what I do know. Here's an explanation that I do have. God is getting your attention. God is getting my attention. And if we come out of this financial crisis just white-knuckling our way back to financial normalcy, and we go back and we use our money in all the same ways that we did before this happened, I'm afraid that we've missed the message that God has for us. God is speaking through this situation to his people, and he's saying, are you using the money that I've entrusted you with? Are you managing it in a way 
that results in the extension of my kingdom in works of compassion, in my mission upon the earth. If not, there's still time to get it right, to repent and to turn to him. So I want to finish this morning with a, uh, I want to show you a video in just a moment. It's a very brief video, and it comes from a pastor in Dallas. She's a friend of mine. Her name's Tracy Eckert, Pastor Tracy Eckert. And she put this video out on YouTube. It's been viewed almost 200,000 times, which honestly encourages me. It encourages me because people are listening. What is God saying in this hour? And that's what she attempts to address in this video. In this video, she's going to share a dream that she had about what God is doing through this coronavirus situation and everything that it touches in our lives. Now, I know that some of our viewers are not used to thinking about like the idea that God would speak through a dream, okay? And I would just tell you that the Bible, from the very beginning of it to the very end of the Bible, has him speaking through dreams and visions, and it actually says that this will increase, not decrease, the further we progress uh, in time. Okay, so we don't get our worldview from the world. We get it from the scriptures. God says that he'll speak through dreams. I believe, I believe that he's speaking through this dream, and I want to show it to you and then finish with a comment. So on March 18th, um, I had a dream, and in the dream I heard the audible voice of the Lord. And he said, I am not calling it coronavirus. He said, I am calling it the homecoming. I am calling it the homecoming. And then I saw a man and he had his arms cut off. He had his arms amputated and he was there with amputated arms. And we were so excited about him. We are so excited about his coming home. And so we were throwing this huge party for him. There was the big celebration. We were setting a table, a banqueting table and I feel like what the Lord is saying is that your strength has been taken from you. And he's speaking to his people. Through all of this, your arms have been cut off and your strength has been taken from you. Your strength, your ability to build your own kingdom, your ability to build for yourself, to do for yourself, to create for yourself. And so there is, it's literally in the physical there's been a homecoming. People now are in their homes and they've been called back from the marketplace and into their homes, into their homes with their family, not just with their family, but also with their father. And so he's saying, I, I'm, 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 I'm calling my kids to come back home. Okay, powerful dream. When I hear that dream, that image she had of the armless man. It actually makes me think about the image that we first began with of the man who's drowning and he's flailing his arms uh, wildly. Pastor Tracy is right, and this is true throughout the scripture, that our arms are representative of the strength of man, strength to build our own kingdom, to do our own thing, to manage our own destiny. And, and many of us in this season of drastic and sweeping change, we're striving like that drowning man to try to get control, to find some stability, to get control of our time, to get control of our money. But our fight for control at its core is a fight against God. It's a fight against rescue. Now I want you to contrast that image that I gave you with that of our Savior giving his life for us on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he surrendered everything. He surrendered his time, allowing it to be cut short. He surrendered his money, died without even the shirt on his back. Rather than flailing his arms wildly in a struggle to seize control, he extended his arms. Number one, in order to surrender control to his heavenly Father. And number two, he extended his arms to embrace those who come to him, who surrender to him in faith. Because Jesus surrendered, he was ultimately rescued, but he wasn't rescued from the cross. He was rescued from the grave. Surrender is painful. That's the message. It's crucifixion. Surrender is painful, but it's not the same as giving up 
Surrender is positioning ourselves to be rescued by Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you, we worship you, we praise you. And Father, there are various people from various uh, walks of life, some who are very much struggling right now for control. I pray that you would show us practically what it looks like to surrender control to you, surrender our time to you, surrender our money to you. I pray that you would give us the peace that comes with surrender. And I pray, Lord, that you would also give us the provision that comes with surrender because you are a God of rescue. You are a God who loves to care for us as you demonstrated through your life, death, and resurrection. I thank you for these things, and I pray them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, what we're, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, two things I want you to know about. Uh, in a few moments, we're going to take communion. So if you don't have your bread and your wine or your grape juice, you can, you can go get that now. Uh, but as you guys have been notified, I've seen them put it up on the screen. We are going to do a question and answer as we typically have. And so, uh, and so I'm going to take a few minutes and just answer some of your questions. And, uh, and just like we did last week, if, if I don't get to all of your questions, I'll follow up in our Friends of God online community and answer those questions. But here's the first one. Uh, this one is from Facebook. It says, how can we tell if we are properly stewarding our time or being mastered by our to-do list? I think that's a great question, and, uh, and I would say the answer, it, it really comes down to the peace that we feel in our hearts. If we feel like, like, like here's one barometer I use in my own life. Like if I feel like, like let's say I have an 1130 meeting. If I feel like I have to work until 1129 and 30 seconds on something else, and this is like the habit of my life, I'm showing I don't actually have peace about it. I'm, I'm constantly striving to do more, 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 so I can finally get ahead, get ahead, get ahead, get ahead, get ahead. And I never, if I never feel like I'm ahead, if I'm constantly pushing that line, it shows that I, that I haven't really surrendered. Because once you surrender, you actually do experience tangible peace. I would say this isn't a once for all decision. This is an everyday decision. And so what I try to do on the front end is say, God, how do you want me to spend my time today? How do you want me, uh, uh, what do you want, how do you want me to spend my time next year? You know, James does say, if the Lord wills, you, you can still make plans, but God gets the trump card. And so we invite him into the planning process. And then as we're executing those plans, if we just still don't feel peace, we just really haven't surrendered. So I, that's what I would say is how you know. And, and then I'll take it a step further. Rather than just trying to do better next time, I would say that if you feel that lack of peace, then I would just say, say, say to God, I repent. I'm sorry for trying to uh, serve my to-do list instead of you. I'm sorry for making my calendar my master instead of you. I repent and I turn to you and I ask for you to help me to change and give me peace. Next one. Uh, this one is from Robert. It says, what is the Lord saying to the ones that haven't been slowed down by this event? Uh, great question too. And this is part of the challenge of it. You like, I know for me personally with, uh, with the church, uh, my work schedule has definitely not slowed down. Okay. There have been, I mean, the efforts of like reworking everything we do in the way, in the way of just kind of the rhythm of what church looks like. I'm doing a lot more podcasts and video stuff these days. So it definitely hasn't slowed down. Uh, but what I would say is, is in the midst of that, and I, and I know that's true for some of, some of you work in the financial sector, it speeds up, it doesn't slow down. And I would say it's different for all of us. And so I don't, I, I want you to hear me. I'm not saying that everyone, like it wouldn't be right for me to say, oh, well, they don't need online church. We'll just get this figured out. They don't need to hear from their pastor. You know, like I need to be doing what I need to do. And people in the financial sector or other, you know, in the medical field, they need to be doing, it's not like nurses and doctors in New York City. We need to just be like, take some more time off. You know, like they need to be engaged. Okay. I think slow down is not just a word that refers to physical activity. It refer refers to a state of heart. Whenever you read Psalm 46, it says, be still and know that I am God. Okay. That stillness, some versions will say, cease striving. It's actually a state of heart, a state of pause, to actually pause and know that he is God. He is in control. He has got this. And, and as Psalm 46 goes on, 
It says, even though the earth should change and the mountain should slip into the heart of the sea, and though its waters foreign roar and foam, and though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, I will not fear. Okay, so he's holding on to the one constant that he has. So, so I, here's what I would say. I, I would say that even if your job has not slowed down, you need to find time to slow down. You need to find time, be it in the morning, be it at night. You need to find time to slow down and to seek God. Don't just let a new crazy normal take you away. Those who are homeschooling kids uh, and trying to work at the same time, don't just let the new normal sweep you away. Find that time to be with Jesus. I did a devotional on this a few weeks ago about awakening the dawn. Start your day instead of letting your day start you. That's one way. I'm sure some of you in the comment sections probably have other ways to answer that question. Feel free to put that in. Okay. Uh, Next one, it says, how do you navigate making your own plans and asking for God's blessing or making the plans God wants you to make? Very good, because it's, this is definitely not meant to communicate, don't make plans, okay? Uh, when James says, don't boast about tomorrow, this actually comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 1. Proverbs is more devoted to making plans than any other book of the Bible. So it's definitely not like God is anti-plan. The, the idea is we have to plan in humility. James is concerned about the state of our heart. Now, verbally, I think it's good to say, hey, Lord, if you will, but it's, it's more than just a verbal statement. In our heart, we have to recognize, okay, this is the plan I'm making, but God can pull the trump card. And the way I talk to, for instance, our pastoral staff about this and the way we run like a, your average Sunday meeting, for instance, we plan it because we want to, we want to put on the greatest possible uh, service so that more people can encounter the Holy Spirit, so more people can be spiritually fed, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to, we call it planning for greatness. But the way I say it is we plan by the Spirit and we improvise by the Spirit. Because there are moments in a Sunday service where we need to say, okay, what's the Holy Spirit doing now? And we might shift gears a little bit. Okay, so that's what I would say to you. In your life, plan by the Spirit and improvise by the Spirit. But if you're only improvising by the Spirit and you're not planning, uh, good luck. It's not going to work very well. These should be married together. Okay, I'm going to take um, one more question. Uh, this one's from YouTube. It says, how do you decide what to keep and what to drop post-coronavirus? Very good, very good question. Um, I think what I would say, I mean, first of all, all of life is friendship with God. All of life is a conversation with God. And so I would say, and, and what I said in the message was prayerfully and carefully, okay? So like parents, like if you had kids in sports four nights a week and then all day on Saturday and often on Sunday, maybe you ask the Lord, hey, do we really need to do all those sports and on all those days and nights or do I need to do something different? Okay, now that's one example, but that could apply to our finances. That could apply to number of nights you're out each week on social engagements. And you just get together with the Lord and ask him. And if you're married, I would say get together with your spouse and say, Lord, what are you saying to us in this hour about how we use our time? So, so that's what I would say. The other thing is you might find that there are certain things that you've begun to do as part of your new normal. That it's like, wow, God's really blessing this. That's what I've begun to find for myself with podcasting. You know, every episode we shoot, 1,000, 2,000 views, you know. Some of them have hit 10 and 20 and 30,000 views. And so uh, it's like, man, God is really blessing this. I I was already putting some energy into that, but it, it feels to me like, okay, if God's breathing life on this, I need to keep running with it. And so that can be part of how you sift it. Uh, what is God breathing life on that you're doing as part of your new normal? Okay, so those are a few responses. If you have any others, please let me know in the comments section. Now I get to my very favorite part of the service. Well, gosh, that's hard to pick. They're all my favorite part. Um, but this is, um, this is where we partake of Holy Communion, also called the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Uh, and so Eucharist is just where we get, it uh, just comes from the Greek word for thanks or thanksgiving. And so uh, this is a time where we express our gratitude for what God has done in our lives. And, and it's so important to me and special to me to end a service this way because we've been giving God our worship. We've been 
uh, you know, I've been challenging you to respond to God. And we've been reading James's bold and abrupt words and, and feeling a little spurred in our spirit to go out and do something. But communion reminds us that the entirety of the Christian life is not about what we do for God, but what God has done for us. That's what communion is about. And so I'm going to lead you in this 2,000-year-old tradition that the church has been pa- uh, practicing for all of these years where Jesus took the bread and then the cup, and each of these had significance in pointing to and signifying the death of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the new covenant of forgiveness that he offers. And so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then I'll lead you in that time. Father, I pray that you would uh, just guide this time. Give us an experience of you. You say in your word that Jesus is present in a mystical and special way that is beyond words, but that he is present in the partaking of communion. And so we ask for your presence. I bless this bread, this wine. Be present, Lord. And now, I'll quote the scripture to you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Believer, partake of the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that you gave us on the cross. Now take the cup. And after supper, he shared a meal with his closest friends, and he partook of the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You may partake. Thank you, Jesus, that you actually spilled your blood for us on the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice and the privilege to be part of your spiritual family. And Father, um, I just pray for, uh, for all of our viewers, for everybody who's, uh, who's tuned in with us today. I pray that you would protect each one from spiritual and, f- and physical harm. I pray, Father, uh, that you would grant a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our ministry teams. Okay, speaking into that, we're going to have some ministry teams available after the service. And, um, and, as, and at the conclusion of this prayer, sorry, I'm kind of going out of prayer and into this. Um, at the conclusion of this service, there will be uh, an email on the screen. If you need prayer for anything at all in your life, please email this number. And if you just want to talk to a pastor, just email, or email this address and, uh, and we'll follow up with you. And so, Father, once again, I come back to you and, and I just pray uh, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, for our ministry teams, that you would heal, reveal, and set people free. And Father, I pray for each family represented uh, this morning. I pray that you would protect each one from spiritual and physical harm, make our homes both a refuge and a wellspring of life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. See you next week for Pack Your Bags Part 2, Embracing Change. Have a great